Hello, everybody. Hello, we are live. We are live on this beautiful Tuesday morning. Hope you're doing okay. I am Bill, the company's expert, and I am doing something a little bit different. A little bit different than what I normally do. This is not a live stream that's generally a Q&A about uh, jobs and careers. This is not a live stream about side hustles and startups and entrepreneurship. This is something different. And this was actually born out of uh, a question somebody asked me, actually a couple of questions people asked me uh, in the last couple of live streams. Somebody asked me what was the uh, best piece of life advice I ever got. And I drew a blank because I'm not one for advice and uh, I don't really have many memories of people taking me aside and giving me this life advice like you would see in movies. You know, the, the wise old man or woman advises the young person, you know what to do. I don't really have any stories of that, but um, being uh, middle-aged, going on old age, and uh, talking often to people in their 20s, as I do on YouTube here, I figured this might be something I would do. Um, so we have a chat. There is a chat, and I will be taking questions. So if you are here, uh, if you see a chat, if you're watching this on YouTube, there should be a chat box. Get in there and say something and you can ask me questions and uh, we'll see where this goes. I really don't have a plan. This is kind of one of the side effects of just uh, putting these live streams into the blank spots in my schedule. So <laughs> unfortunately, there's not a lot of preparation that goes into this. So uh, I'm just going to start by looking at the chat here. So we got Rene Lee Greco, who says, I began my business management career in my early 20s while I attended college in the quarter system. Um, definitely. Looking forward to the stream. Well, thank you, Renee. Um, yeah, you know, uh, people in their 20s, when you're in your 20s, uh, it's a weird time. It, it was a weird time for me, and I know it's a weird time for many, many other people. And I see that every time I look at YouTube comments, uh, comments that people write on my own uh, YouTube channel. It's a rough time. You, your, your life is in transition, and uh, there's a lot of things going on. and. Uh, it's it's probably the most impactful period or decade in people's lives, you know? Uh lots of upheaval, lots of questioning. You're really looking to find yourself. That that keeps going by the way. <laughs> that doesn't end in your 20s, but it's your first sort of stepping out into the world for a lot of people and uh it it's a it's really a, a reality check. There's a lot of there's a lot of that for most people in their 20s. You know, usually in your teens, you kind of develop ideas of what you think the world is about, not having experienced it firsthand, but, you know, what you're told or the impression you get from things. And then usually in your 20s, that's when you get out and uh, <laughs> and and see if that was true or not. And usually it is not true. Usually a big part of it is not true. You uh, learn a lot. Positive Vibes says hello. Hello, Positive Vibes. That's a good name. Um, yeah, so, so a lot of people are going through some stuff and the usual thing that I'm talking to people about, which is getting a job, right? Or careers, you know, that's a huge part of that. A big part of what you're going to do with your life does depend on your occupation, uh, what you do to make money. And a lot of times there's a disconnect between what you want to do and what you end up doing. And there's many reasons for that. Uh, one of the things they don't really, uh, to my knowledge, still today, they don't really teach everybody is some good practical advice in high school. I find that the educational system, traditionally, being what it is, it's full of people that don't really have a lot of practical experience with the real world. So in terms of them being able to prepare you, you know, for the real world, um, I find that there's a big disconnect. There certainly was for me when I was younger. And I know that's true for a lot of people still today. You know, you, you don't really get the information that would be the most useful to you on, in practical terms, you know. Josh Miranda says, hello, what would you advise for those people who always failed the interview? Oh, here we go with interviews. This is, this is about kind of life advice. Um, well, look, you know what? This could actually be a segue into talking about this stuff. Um, if you always fail the interview, first of all, there's a couple of things 
there's a couple of principles at play which you may or may not be tuned into. First of all, first of all, when you say you always fail, um, the reality is that uh, at this game, if you're knocking on the door of an employer and saying, let's work together, you know, you're looking for someone who can do this. I, I'm putting myself forward as someone who can do that, you know, and you're sort of uh, seeking their approval. That game traditionally, uh, you know, it's not like every second interview you go to, you get the job. You know what I mean? Um, I, I don't know what the ratio is or the numbers are, but, you know, people have to do many interviews before they before they get hired, before they pass one. That That's typical. You know, you could be a highly qualified, highly employable person, but you still have to go through. You'd still fail, say, 10 interviews. You know, that would be common. That wouldn't be any cause for alarm before somebody hires you. You know what I mean? Um, so, so number one is to know that that is typical, okay? Now, if you've gone to 50 interviews and, and never been hired, then maybe there's an issue. Maybe. Not necessarily, but maybe, okay? Because that's less typical, okay? Now, the second thing is that uh, when it comes, this is like a great segue into what we're going to be talking about today. When you go to a job interview, job interviews are not about your technical skills, okay? They've seen that on your resume and your application. If they didn't feel that you were technically qualified for the job, you wouldn't be at the interview. It would be a colossal waste of everybody's time, including the interviewer's time, to invite someone to an interview that when they read your, your application or your resume, it looked like you weren't qualified, okay? So you, you, in all likelihood, are qualified for the job. What they want to do now is see who you are as a person, and that's what a job interview is about. It's who you are as a person, okay? For example, if you went in there and uh, you had a negative attitude, you know, you gave off vibes that you're a person that they wouldn't be able to work with. They try and give you instructions, you know, of what to do, and you argue back and you refuse to do them and you're just generally unpleasant to deal with. That would be a deal breaker for, for most people, not, not every situation, but for a lot of situations, for a lot of people, that would be a deal breaker. It has nothing to do with how qualified you are. It just, it's more of a personality thing, right? It also is an assessment of your communication skills. Okay. How good you are at communicating. Um, and a lot of people don't understand what, what I mean by that communication skills, it means more than the obvious intuitive meaning communication means like, you know, how effective you are at getting your meaning across. Yeah. But in the real world, okay. People need to be able to interact with you without it ruining their day. You know, things like this, right? There's other things written into that. Um, a lot of communication is voluntary. Okay. You don't necessarily have to communicate with that person, or if you do, you don't have to do it in a certain way. You know, I mean, you could send someone an email saying, do this, signed your boss, you know, like you could do that. No one's going to say you must go and talk to this person, this person in person, and you must do it now, and you must do it this frequently. People decide how they communicate with people often. and. Uh, you know, and, and it's usually a voluntary thing. So if you're so unpleasant to deal with, whenever they deal with you, they come away from the interaction feeling like, God, you know, I hate that person. I hate myself. I hate where I work. I hate my job. If that's the case, it's going to be a big problem. A lot of, pe a lot of technical people and introverted people, of which I am included in that. I'm an introvert. I'm a technical person at heart. Um... That's what they're not taught in school a, a lot, a lot of times. I certainly wasn't. I came out of university with an engineering degree and uh, I was a technical type person. I was more of a technician than an engineer. And uh, this is something nobody ever at any point in my life told me. And it was a problem in the beginning. And I realized this within a couple of years and started taking steps to fix it. Um, so, so if you're not passing a lot of interviews, that's a big part of what interviews are about. It's about assessing what it's like to deal with you. Okay. 
if you go in there and you have strange opinions, like non mainstream opinions that you voice loudly and fanatically, like that's going to be an issue, right? Uh, usually most of the time that'll be an issue. Um, if you're off putting in some way, they don't enjoy dealing with you. That's going to be a problem. If you seem like you're upset or angry or extremely, uh, not comfortable or something, that's going to be an issue because the assumption is that if you're like that in the interview, you're going to be like that on the job, right? That's the assumption people are making, right? So, so the, the, the conclusion of this is the more you can work on your likability, just how pleasant you are. Uh, the more you can work on communication skills, the more you can sort of have a rapport with people. All that stuff will help you. What they tend to do in a lot of situations, like the majority of situations, is hire the person they like the best, they get the best vibe from. Isn't that stupid? Yeah, it, of course it's stupid, but that's how these things end up turning out. That's number one lesson for living in the world. You know, you tend to surround yourself voluntarily by people you get along with, right? So. Being likable to people in general is, is a very, very great attribute. Um, so that's what I would say for that. Um, I guess we could just, we could just take some questions here. Uh, prayer warrior four says, how can you present yourself as a confident individual that they want to hire? Uh, well, I, I've done a whole video on that. Um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of little. In a job interview, it's a, there's a lot of little techniques because basically a job interview is a performance. You know, it's, it's a thing that's, that lasts, what, an hour or less, right? So it's a performance. It's like doing a presentation, right? Um, it's an act. You know, you, the, I, the point is, it doesn't have to be, but you could put on an act and a lot of people put on an act. They don't go in there and keep it real, right? If you, if you kept it real and just, you know, be yourself, you know, you would be a lot more informal than was probably appropriate. Um, you know, considering the, the nature of the interaction, they're trying to get you to reveal negative things about yourself. They want to see who you are and they don't want the, uh, the presentation version of yourself. They want the real version of yourself. So they're going to be trying to peel away the, you know, the facade and see who you are. They want to get to the dirt and see who you actually are. So because of the nature of that, it's like, it's like, I imagine it's what trial lawyers feel like when you're going in court in front of a judge and you're having to put on essentially a performance. You prepare for it, you rehearse for it, and then you absolutely nail it. And if you do, you're successful. If you don't and you haven't prepared and you just go in and there and keep it real and you know, this, unless you're, unless you happen to be absolutely brilliant, which is, which is extremely rare. Uh, chances are you will, you will not succeed. You will lose the case. So, so how to do it? Well, I mean, that's when you get into these lower level techniques, you know, you smile, like in the sense that, you know, you're not, you're, you're not, uh, don't look upset. Don't look like, you know, kind of, you look uncomfortable, you look upset, right? That's being honest because in a job interview, you might be uncomfortable and upset, right? So the, but if you show that, if you go in there looking like, you know, I'm nervous, I'm upset, I don't want to talk to you, I just want to get the hell out of here, that gives a very bad first impression, right? So it's about looking comfortable, looking cheerful, look, look like somebody that uh, someone would want to talk to, you know? So I'm trying to look pleasant right now. I'm, I'm not, I don't have a big pearly white smile, but, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to look pleasant, approachable, friendly. Uh, it starts with that. Okay. It's something, it's, I mean, this is absolute basic stuff, but it starts with that. And then, uh, if they say something to you, you want them not to regret that they spoke to you, right? So you can appear annoyed or upset with anything they say, even though let's be honest, we probably are. And a lot of times in the real world, recruiters are anything but professional and courteous. At least all the time. You know, that's what, that's what we find. You know, no matter what the provocation is, sometimes it's intentional. They like try and push your buttons just to see, 
if they can rile you a little. Just, you know, not everyone does that. A lot of people are too incompetent to do that, but, or ineffective at what they're doing, but, but, uh, you know, so, so learning this stuff, for example, this is, this would be awesome if people were taught this, especially people who are not extroverts, people who, you know, they, like IT is a great example. There's so many people in IT that just do not get this at all. You know, they go to a job interview thinking it'll all be all technical questions. Sometimes, sometimes it is, but a lot of times it isn't. It's like a normal interview where it's usually non-technical. And they ask you about your personality, your work habits, uh, times you've demonstrated different things concerning how you interact with others. And this takes a lot of technical people aback because they didn't think that any of this stuff was important. It is. It is. There's no point in hiring someone who's an absolute genius if you can't work with them and if they hate their job. That's the reality. So you got to go in there and uh, regardless of what the reality is, if you want to pass, you have to make them believe that you would enjoy this job and you want to work here and you're a pleasant person. And, you know, if they have any requests for you to do things, it's never an issue. You know how to act properly. You know how to handle different situations and you know how to deal with conflict. Conflict is like a disagreement with somebody. Even if you don't confront somebody about it, you're still feeling conflict. The moment there's a disagreement, you feel conflict. If somebody suggests, hey guys, let's all go here for lunch and you disagree, but you don't say anything, that's still conflict. Right? There's a difference of opinion. One way to handle it is just to repress it. And just, well, I don't want to go there, but I'm not going to say anything. Right? Anyway, this is the kind of stuff that they care about in job interviews. It's, it's, it's a performance. I mean, to, to learn this stuff, it's very low-level things. It's really not like in the category of life advice, really, of how to be and what skills to dedicate yourselves to try and learning. But, uh, but you're just low level things like that. The easiest one and the, the most basic thing ever is just to look pleasant. You would not believe how many IT people I've had to deal with that, you know, you go in there and they just look off putting, they look upset, you know, and then you try and talk to them. It's like, Hey, how's it going today? And they're like, man, it's fine. Y you know, it's like. I don't care if you have a PhD in, you know, computer science or computer engineering. That does not make me want to work with you. Or anyone. That doesn't make anyone want to work with someone like that. It's just that, just like that. That's just how it goes. Um, Big Show says, hit the like button, folks. Thank you, Big Show. That's very flattering. Uh, Josh Miranda, thank you for answering my question. Appreciate it. My pleasure, Josh Miranda. That's what I'm here to do. Um, hello from Armenia. Armenia, Yerevan, right? Awesome. Hello back. Julian or Julien. Alice or Alice, depending on uh, your point of view. This month, I listened to your voice more than my own mother. You are awesome, sir. I could, I could try and do my next live stream falsetto and try and sound more like your mother, if that would help. Um, I mean, I don't want to deprive you of that family interaction that's oh so important. But thank you for saying so, Julien. Julian, uh, that's, that's a very, very nice thing to say indeed, and it makes me feel great. Um, yeah, so listen, what I want to say, I, you know, I started to touch on this in the last live stream. That's what inspired me to do this one. You know, if you're in your 20s, okay, tw people in their 20s, in, in the world of careers and business and employment, a lot of times you feel like you're looked down on, okay? You're usually starting somewhere near the bottom in your 20s. You know, usually the, the norm is older people are more higher up or higher up there at the top or in the middle at least. Younger people are under them and kind of at the bottom making less money, doing more menial tasks, things like this, right? You know, and it feels like people are looking down on you. And uh, also in your 20s, for a lot of people, when it comes to careers anyway, uh, the confidence is not there yet. 
You know, you're taking your first steps. It's like the little kid learning to walk, right? It's like, how confident are they when they're just taking their first steps? They're not confident. They're about to fall down and smash their face any minute, right? So, uh, yeah, the confidence is not there. And because of that, you feel, um, I don't know how to express this, but, you know, you just, you're not in charge. You're not in control. People look down. One thing you have, okay, that, that a lot of middle-aged people will never admit to, or I've never heard them admit to this. They're jealous of people in their 20s because people in their 20s, if there's something you have, it's energy. You got fire, you got passion, and you have youth, you know? All these people running the place that are like talking down to you. And yes, sometimes people like me. They're jealous. They wish they had what you had. There's no way they can have what you have. Okay? You have this world of possibility in front of you. They don't. And you have almost boundless energy, and they don't. You know? And that's what you do have. But a lot of times we don't realize it when we're that age. It's only later. When it gets taken away, that you realize, oh, I had that thing then, and I didn't really realize it or exploit it or, or like use it. Joey T says hi, hi Joey T. I could write my name as Billy T. For that uh, hint of professionalism, right and formality. Hi sir from Japan. Hi back, konnichiwa. Uh, Ter Hiss says, do you have advice for deciding which switching jobs, what? Deciding between switching jobs for a pay rise or staying to avoid the stress of switching jobs and starting from zero again. I have changed jobs ever since 2020. Okay. So you've been jumping around for the last couple of years. Well, listen, okay. The reality is you know, it, it's, it's just random chance what happens, right? In the world of what could happen to your job at a company, right? Um, now, if you've been jumping all over the place and you're just wanting to settle down and you're trying to decide now whether you should switch jobs or, or stay, I mean, I could be totally wrong here, but I'm picking up on the vibes that you would like to stay. If you've been jumping around since 2020, it might be good to stay for a little while, right? Um, whenever you jump jobs, obviously, there's a learning curve. You know, you arrive there, you're not comfortable, you're out of your comfort zone, you got to learn the place, learn the job, learn the people, right? It's nice to be able to get through that learning curve so that you can start to pay off, right? You put in time learning all these people's names and getting to know them. You've put in time learning how to do this job and maybe how to do it well. You've put in your time learning the culture of the organization, what they expect, how they behave, what they feel is appropriate and normal. You've learned all that. So it's nice to stay for a little while to, to get a payoff from all that work you put in. So if you can do that, I don't think that's a bad idea. However, I mean, it's your life. So if you are fundamentally unhappy with where you are, you got to take that into account, right? It's good to stay and learn stuff, okay? And then stay to have it pay off. But if it's something that's totally incompatible with your life goals or your career goals, or if it's just a really unpleasant place to be, obviously that's going to inform your decision too. I can't tell you what to do. It matters. You have to weigh these different things. But hopefully that helps. Um, Desert Duck. Imagine your youthful energy plus your current experience could be merged. Yes. Yes, that's my idea of heaven. Being able to do the whole thing again, except you keep your knowledge. That would be awesome. Joey T, could you talk about dealing with interpersonal relationships in an international company? Well, I mean, that's a huge, huge topic. You'd have to be more specific. Um, just in a nutshell. If I had to say one thing about it, it would be this, okay? One of the biggest things you learn in the world of like dealing with people, okay? Some people, to some people, this is blindingly obvious. To other people, they never learn this throughout their entire lives. And that is that people are different from you. So for example, if you think a certain thing is appropriate, 
That doesn't mean that everyone will think it's appropriate. If you think a certain way of working with somebody is the right way of working with somebody and there, and there is no other way of working with someone, that's incorrect. There are many ways of working with other people. And just at, at random chance, the person you're dealing with doesn't have the same work style as you or the same communication style or the same personality. So everyone is really good at, at working with people who are just like themselves. Okay. So if you are an introverted accountant and you have to work with another introverted accountant, you could probably work okay. And uh, you could probably get along really well. If you are an introverted accountant that then has to work closely with an extroverted salesperson, that's where the challenge is. And the first step of doing that effectively is to realize that just because I do things a certain way and have certain preferences, I can't assume that they share those preferences and those uh, styles of, do of doing things. Okay. It took me a, a, quite a few years to realize this, that, you know, because if you get a job in a place with a lot of other people like you that have studied that thing, you know, you tend to be with people that are more like you than unlike you, uh, as opposed to being put in just a random collection of people, right? If you, if you go to say, I don't know, go to, go to where a crowd is like the mall or, you know, something like that, the people around you, chances are you'll be in sort of a good cross section of different types of people. But if you go to, if you look at your workplace, it won't be as random. It'll be more, more weighted to like a certain background, a certain personality type, that kind of thing. So if you spend your whole career in that environment, you get this false impression that a lot of people are more like you and they aren't, you know? For example, if you work in a company and you work in the legal department, you might end up working with a lot of people that are more like you than, than a random uh, If you see what I'm saying, excuse me. <coughs> oh, I'm coming down with a chest cold, so you'll have to make allowances. I'm sorry. Oh, I spent the last two minutes trying to avoid coughing. <clears throat> So anyway, that is actually, a, somebody asked me, what's the biggest piece of life advice? Well, I don't know if this is life advice, but it's, um, it's the biggest, one of the biggest help, most helpful lessons I've learned is that what really takes skill is being able to work with people that are not like you just because they do things a different way. Doesn't mean that they're an idiot or they're stupid. I've seen the value of this. I've seen people that are not like me, you know, maybe they're from sales or whatever, you know, like extroverted salespeople. I use that as an example of someone who's not like me, introverted technical person. Okay. I have seen how they kick ass at certain tasks that I struggle with. So being able to see that and then respect their abilities and say, wow, okay, having that way of doing things is actually good to do certain, uh, to accomplish certain goals. That's not, that's a lesson I didn't really see until my late twenties, early thirties. I didn't really see good examples of that. So anyway, <clears throat> so there you go. Um, so anyway, international companies. So international companies, you have that plus cultural differences, plus a lot of times language barriers. Okay. So that's what makes it like a high level challenge. Okay. If you're talking generalities, dealing with interpersonal relationships in an international company. So it's sort of like the heavyweight championship of, uh, you know, interoperating with people. Okay. Um, okay, Julian, I'm looking for a job and I tried your advice to connect with people on LinkedIn, but the problem is LinkedIn isn't popular in the country I live in. Is there somewhere else I can, uh, somewhere else I can do to connect with people? Well, I mean, yes, you can, you can use the same principles. LinkedIn is a great, uh, 
vehicle to do that because you can do it from the comfort of your own, you know, home or your own desk and just connect with all kinds of people all over the world. Now, if they don't, if they favor a different solution for that in your country, uh, whatever the solution is, whatever the platform is, uh, yeah, use that, use that. It's the the same principles apply. Okay. Um, I mean, it's, you can apply these principles to in-person networking, right? You know, uh, traditionally what people would do is they would go to events, right? There'd be events and they were, you know, it was like you, you are in a room full of people, right? And you can use the same sort of tech, uh, techniques to do it. I'm having problems speaking today. I don't know if it's a sickness or, or what, <laughs> but I'm tripping over my words. So I'm sorry, you'll have to just be patient with me, apparently. Um, yeah, use whatever platform you have at your disposal. That's what that's how we do this. So if LinkedIn isn't a thing uh, where you are, uh, use whatever is a thing. You know, the other thing is that a lot of people like, listen, when I'm talking about networking, OK, um, the problem is. It's not something you could explain to someone in five minutes because there's many principles you need to understand. Like, for example, let's say you're talking to someone who's 18 years old. They've never been to a job interview. They don't have a resume. They've never given a thought to what they want to do for the rest of their lives. And they've never been introduced to the concept of money. You need money to pay rent or to have a home uh, in some way, shape or form and to buy food. They've never been exposed to any of that. Like they've never been introduced to the principles of home economics, nothing. Okay. So you want to give them some advice. You can't just spend five minutes with them and expect them to just understand it all, right? There's many principles. They all have to, they have to understand all of them because they're all applying at once, right? The world of networking is kind of like that. You know, uh, you can't reduce it to a headline. And what I've seen people do is, you know, they pick up, oh yeah, okay, networking, networking, I need to network. So what they do is they go on LinkedIn and then they connect to recruiters. It's like, no, no, that's not what this is about. That's not how you do that, right? I I understand where they're coming from. They're doing this to try and get a job. So they think, okay, who should I connect to that can give me a job? Ah, recruiters. No. Right. So it's so when you say, you know, LinkedIn isn't a thing, it doesn't work for me. uh, That's contingent upon, you know, you understand all these principles and you're following all of them. It's not just, you know. Oh, I got on LinkedIn. I asked somebody for a job. They said no. So therefore it doesn't work. You know, that kind of thing. So make sure you're kind of getting the whole the whole deal. okay? and this stuff usually takes if, if you're not sort of getting it all in one place, it usually takes a few years to learn it um, by doing it. Like what type of people are inclined to speak with you when you say a certain thing that takes many years to, to build up, like to learn that by, uh, from practice. Okay. If you're told the principles at the beginning, that saves a lot of time. Uh, okay. There's some interesting things going on. Uh, Joey T you're awesome. You don't have to post things like repeatedly. I I see it. Okay. Uh, a couple of days ago, I noticed that there were some issues with the chat. People were posting things and I could see it in my feed, but it wasn't showing up in YouTube's feed, which didn't make sense to me because my feed comes from YouTube and I could see their comments, but they weren't being shown in the chat box that everybody else could see. So I, I don't know what was going on. Um, I don't know if, I don't know if there was a bug somewhere, but, um, uh, but you shouldn't have to post things uh, over and over. Um, My internet just failed. Sorry. Okay, no problem. No problem. Not a problem. Sanket says, my interview went really well. Okay, we're talking about interviews again. My interview went really well two weeks ago. However, HR calls me last week and says we are still evaluating all the candidates. We will give the result next week, which is tomorrow. The interview went 17 minutes over. Hiring manager said I got exact same strong feedback from the other heads who interviewed me. Yeah. Okay. Look, what does it matter? None of that matters. If they call you great. Awesome. 
Be super friendly, pursue it, see where it goes. If they don't call you, don't worry about it. Don't, don't do all this soul searching and like, you know, like replaying it over in your head and stuff. Focus on the next opportunity, okay? The, the majority of leads that you follow, whether you go to interviews or you send out applications or you talk to people, okay, whatever your leads are, the majority of them are not going to work out, okay? Most are not going to work out. So don't worry about those. If you get callbacks, great. If you don't, don't sweat it, okay? It is not a reflection of you. It is not a reflection of your skills or anything, not even your social skills. Even after everything I said earlier, it's not a reflection of your social skills or your communication skills or your likability. It's simply what they were looking for. Okay. You, if, if you don't get a call back and they pass over you to hire somebody else, what does that mean? That simply means you were not what they were looking for, what they had in mind. And let me tell you, a lot of companies that are looking for people, a lot of organizations, they're looking for the wrong thing. They have really, really strange ideas of, you know, what they think would be a good candidate. So if you don't measure up, that's not necessarily a statement that anything's wrong. That's a statement that these people are out to lunch half the time. Okay, I know what I'm talking about here. You know, you know how well job interviews are conducted and how well they assess people and how professionally they treat you, right? Usually not very. Well, that's the same, that the same thing applies to their thought processes on what they're even looking for in the first place. You know, I've seen all kinds. I've seen from like very conservative people who have the attitude that if you've never done this before, how could you possibly know what to do, right? I've seen that attitude and all the way to the other extreme where it's like, oh, you're a smart person and I like you, so therefore you could do anything, right? I've seen, I've seen it all and everything in between, all kinds of crazy idiotic theories of who would be the right person and what traits they would have and what would they would have on their resume. I've seen it all and, and it just makes you weep a lot of times. So don't sweat it, okay? Just put your... Put as many leads out there as you can. Try to get them as good quality as you can at the same time. So quantity and quality. And keep moving forward. Okay? And then the other life advice I would have, if we're talking life advice, which is what this is supposed to be about, career advice, is just to recognize that... The whole point of all of this is to make money, right? Is to, I mean, that's a huge part. That's kind of the necessity. We all need money to live. We need to eat. But at the end of the day, that forces you to go out and have some kind of career or occupation. There are other secondary goals, like you want to do something that you're interested in, something that's, you know, that uh, you feel it's improving who you are. I mean, those are all secondary goals, right? But just to recognize that this whole thing of getting a job, that's only one of several ways to accomplish that goal. Okay? So depending where you are in your career, maybe you've had a couple of jobs already. Maybe you're in your late 20s. Okay? Remember, there's more to a career and employment and being wealthy than getting a job. You know what I'm saying? That's certainly part of it for a lot of people but there are other options okay namely namely you can create money yourself you don't need to go to an intermediary necessarily for some people that want to do certain things yeah you pretty much have to but for a lot of other things you don't have to and there's never been a better time to expose that to the world than right now more people are sort of dropping out of the um the labor pool for employers and they're just going direct they're making they're generating the wealth themselves so i'm not here to preach all about that uh but i am here to say that that is a thing okay and if you are disenchanted with having a string of jobs and they just never get any better but yet you feel you've got a lot of value Maybe take steps into that other world, 
where you learn how to make turn your value directly into money instead of going through an intermediary who uses you to generate money and then gives you a little tiny piece of it a tiny fraction of what you actually generate okay that would be like people are asking me about jobs and job interviews so that would be my 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 advice for that listen in your 20s try stuff okay try stuff there'll be plenty of time to to play it safe later and what i mean what i mean by this is this this is not the most original thing i'm saying a lot of people encourage younger people to go out and do things okay but i want to qualify this a little bit a lot of people seem to think that you know oh you can take risks you know a lot of people throw that term around take risk without actually knowing what it means okay everything you do is a risk okay staying at your job is a risk instead of looking for a new one that is a risk okay and it doesn't mean be reckless i don't recommend anyone is reckless okay going trying stuff and taking risks doesn't mean just like being an idiot and doing really ill-advised things that probably won't work out and then you have absolutely no safety net whatsoever that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about trying things going for things in a calculated way you know you get the best of both worlds you get to uh learn you get to get new experiences that will be very formative for you but at the same time you're not destroying your entire life you're not like committing financial suicide you're not landing up in a hopeless situation you know things like that okay but if you have the opportunity to do something something new something that's a little bit out of your comfort zone try it in your 20s a lot of things will be out of your comfort zone by definition almost anything everything will be out of your comfort zone because you've never been there before right don't shy away from it it's actually good Where did I leave off here? Um, you're absolutely welcome, Sankit. Uh, Justin. Justin says, is the fear of embarrassing myself just in my head? No, no, it's not. It's something that everybody feels. It's actually a survival mechanism. Like, for example, I've talked before about public speaking. And almost everybody, every certainly every normal, uh, well-adjusted person, has a fear of public speaking when you first start out and that's a survival mechanism because you know humans have evolved uh, as i've been given to understand that humans have evolved uh to be hardwired like that because in back in the days when we were hunter gatherers and all this kind of stuff if you were in the wilderness and all of a sudden you came across a group of humans that you didn't know and they were all staring at you that was bad. That was a bad situation to be in because they were probably going to kick your butt and steal your food, right? Uh, if not kill you. So we're hardwired to be afraid of a lot of people staring at all at us, right? So if you feel uh, like, you, as you say, the fear of embarrassment, okay? I mean, I'm not a psychologist, but in my in my experience uh that's sort of closely related you're embarrassed because you don't know what you're doing right you you you're rarely embarrassed when you know you're doing something that you've done a thousand times before and you feel that you can do well you know that's not usually when we feel embarrassed right uh usually when we feel embarrassed is because we feel we're not doing well we're uncomfortable we're out of our comfort zone we're doing something we've never tried before we feel like we're not very good at it, you know, that kind of thing, right? Um, and the problem is, is when you combine that with the principle of practice makes perfect, right? To get good at something, you have to do it over and over and over again, right? But the problem is if the first time you try it, you're too embarrassed or you feel so unpleasant doing it that you don't persist with it, you stop. That's basically condemning yourself to never being good at it right if you don't even want to you did it once you tried it once and uh, you're done now right well that pretty much means you're never going to master it <laughs> right so that's where this can be an issue okay there are some things that 
you know, you don't need to do. Like, for example, let's say the worst thing you could ever possibly imagine. You're, you're, the stuff of your nightmares are you getting up in front of, I don't know, your family or your school or your, your workplace and trying to do stand-up comedy. You know, maybe that's just something you, you're not good at and you would fu- you'd be extremely embarrassed trying to do, right? That's what you dread. Okay? Do you need to be a stand-up comedian? Is that a goal of yours? It won't be for most people, so you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to face your fear and conquer it when it comes to something that you don't really care about, right? So, so it's, not, it's not a bad thing to feel. Everybody feels it. And should you push through it and force yourself to do it? Well, it depends what the payoff is. If the payoff is something that, you know, would be one of your goals, then maybe it's worth, it's worth trying to muscle up the resolve or at least do it in a way that, that you can persist with it finding a way of doing it in a way you can persist with it you know in this life a lot of times people present options to us they say okay uh you need to do this and uh it needs to be done this way there is no other way so the only choice you have is whether you do this this way or you don't a lot of times that's false i can't tell you how many times i've been faced with that people saying it's either this or that they're wrong and they're stupid. It's like if they put a bit of intelligence into it, you find that there's actually a third way, a way that works for you. You can get the benefit of this without some of the drawbacks. But that's the, that isn't the standard path. That's usually not the option presented to you. And if you're smart and you're a little bit creative, you can find these middle ways for everything. Let's find a way that works for you. When I talk about networking, that's an example of that. I say, let's do networking over LinkedIn. And I, I like that. It, it worked for me, and I know it works for a lot of others. Because if you happen to be introverted, and going up and talking to people you don't know, especially when you're in your 20s, is not something you feel comfortable doing, does that mean, oh, you have to do this, or you can't do it? It's like, no, no. There's a middle way. You can still do networking. You can do networking over platforms like LinkedIn, where you don't have to meet the person, you don't have to cold call them, but you still reach out to people you don't know, you still make a good impression, um, and if it makes sense, you can set up actual face-to-face meetings and things like that. That's a great solution for a lot of introverts. Nobody presented me with that option, you know, years ago. Nobody said that this was a thing. I mean, in all fairness, this is before the internet, but um, but this is the great thing. It's a halfway house, right? It's kind of like, in my mind, it's a middle road. You want to network, but you're an introvert. Well, here's a way you can do it. That is actually effective, right? You know, that's, that's kind of every, everybody who's listened to, to my um, podcasts and, and, and my live streams and watch my videos, you know that I have a little bit of a chip on my shoulder about formal education, at least the culture of formal, formal education. I find that, uh, and this is from, you know, being someone who's gone through the school system, but also having gone back into it, having taught at universities and colleges on the side and in the last 10 years. And, uh, it's like, yeah, these people live in like, a, at least what I saw is they live in like a artificial little world of their own that's completely removed from the real world. <laughs> you know, the way they talk to each other, the way they work with each other, the, w- the way they interact with each other, what would normally be considered inappropriate is just the way they do things. I remember thinking like, wow, I, you wouldn't be able to get away with that in most private sectors that I've been in, <laughs> you know, just how you ask for someone's help or how you tell them this is what we're going to do now. Like things like this, you know, and they, and they do that to students. They have this sort of um, arrogant kind of thing like, oh, we know it all. And then they tell people stuff and it's incorrect. When it comes to like the real world, like how to do things, it's incorrect. They'll say, okay, you can either get a job or I don't know, or nothing. Maybe that's it. That's your option. There is no other way. You know, and it's like wrong. 
Wrong. You can get a job or you can start your own business. You know, yeah, you could do those, but there's other things too. So a good thing is to be able to question when you're young. There's a lot of, I would have thought that when the internet came in, people would, it would open people up because knowledge is free and people would be able to think for themselves. I feel that people have actually gone the other way. I see a lot of young people that don't question things. And I don't know why that is. I think maybe the school system is beating that out of them. You have to conform. We tell you the rules. You follow the rules. You don't argue back. You don't question. If you don't follow the rules, you get bad marks. You get kicked out of school. You know, so you get rewarded for conformity and just accepting what we say. And this can be dangerous because when you get, when school ends and you come out into the real world, the people telling you how they do stuff, it's completely self-serving. Certainly in the world of careers. You guys might have seen that with a lot of job postings and job interviews. It's completely self-serving. They're not honest with you. They're not, they don't have your interests in mind. It's purely selfish. The motivation is selfish. Right? I'm not necessarily saying that they're bad for doing that. I mean, everyone ask, acts in their own self-interest to varying degrees. We all do it. When you go, bu- go to the store and you s- decide what products you're going to buy, you exhibit exactly the same behavior. Um, but the problem is, is that people just don't question it. They don't realize that, say, employers are acting in their own pure self-interest. They are feeding you essentially lies if it serves them better. You know, I've been on the inside of these things. I've led, I've, I've, I've directed policies and stuff, you know, about things like this. I mean, it's, you, you have to, to, to make the money and all that. Unfortunately, you know, I mean, you try and do it with a sense of ethics, but there are a lot of people that don't. And uh, the problem is, a lot of people learn, learn the hard way especially when you're young. And I got that too. I was exploited too. The first couple of career jobs I had in my early 20s, my mid 20s, I was exploited. And you're told like, oh, this is normal when it's not. And this is reasonable when it's not. You're told things like, oh yeah, we pay way better than any other company, you know, in this space or something. Incorrect. They'll lie right to your face. So you can't really take people at their word for that. You've got to question, you've got to investigate, you've got to learn to figure out stuff on your own and and get information about stuff. Anyway, I'm sorry if this is turning into just a rambling journey to nowhere, (laughs) Uh, but we did get some good questions. Um, Let's see. Anyway, that long winded trip to nowhere, uh, hopefully was at least somewhat helpful. uh, Justin, that was, you asked a very good question. You sent me off for about what, 15 minutes talking about that. Matt says, I've been at the same job for 15 years because I love it. However, I would suggest young people not spend more than five years at a job. Loyalty to an organization is not valued today, plus stunts your earnings. Um, I don't know about stunting your earnings. Yeah, definitely in a lot of situations it will, but not necessarily. But I I definitely agree with you about the first part. You know, um, there are advantages to staying at places, especially large employers that are more traditionally minded, they reward longevity. They reward seniority. You know, like that's just how they think. And like it or not, logical or not, that's how they think. But I wholeheartedly agree with Matt when he says to to move around, okay? five years, I don't know if I necessarily draw the line at five years, but you could apply that at three years Um, or even two years, depending on the situation. If you've learned everything there is to learn and, you know, beyond that, you're not super excited about doing the job every day. If you want to act purely in your own self-interest and you're on a trajectory to learn as much as you can, get as much experience as you can, that can help. The other factor here, though, is that there's a difference between you learning and there's a difference between other people valuing your experience. (coughs) So let's say 
you've had five jobs, okay? And at each job, you stayed for three years. So you've been working for 15 years. And those five jobs have been in strategic cross-sections of your industry, okay? Now, you and I both know that this gives you a hell of a lot of valuable experience, okay? You've seen almost every facet of, you know, a company in that particular business. Who best would be, who, who would be best positioned to lead an organization like that? It would be someone like you. Okay, all things being equal, because you've seen where the rubber hits the road in, say, operations, sales, customer relations, uh, cost structure, efficiency and improvement, safety, quality, environmental, uh, you know, like all the different sales techniques, inside sales, outside sales, international operations, like whatever it is, right? You've, you've seen quite a bit of that. You know, and you, it's not like you just took the tour. You actually got your hands dirty and you learned, you got down in the weeds in like each of these areas. It's a hell of a lot of valuable experience there. Now you can imagine if you were to tack on some business training, um, you were to tack on some incredible communication skills, social skills, diplomatic skills on top of that, you know, you could lead a company to success. It, it, you know, there's, there's a lot of value there, but you're trying to get a job with a recruiter who looks at your resume and goes, okay, you got three experience, three years here, three years here, three years here, all in different areas. It's like, what is that? You know, what is that? That's like, you know, you're starting down one path, you go down that path and you stop and then you come back here and then you go down another path and you stop four out of the five jobs. The experience is inapplicable for the position that I'm hiring for, right? So you may be shocked to find that like, oh, I've got all this great experience and we all know that this is like very valuable to know this stuff. Certainly a lot more valuable than working in any one of those jobs for 15 years, right? Because you're just doing the same thing over and over again for 15 years, essentially, right? But for whatever reason, they will value the candidate who's worked in that one job for 15 years over someone like you who's also worked for 15 years, but they've got a much better cross-section and they've seen so many different things and their decision making is much more informed because they see how what they do fits into this larger operation you know the person i would hire would be the one who's moved around and a lot of people would hire however you go to recruiters and they don't think like that at all right now if you don't know how to bypass recruiters and look at other job opportunities or other possibilities uh that's not going to pay off right so this is good advice however it, it's contingent upon other things too and remember what's what's a learning experience for you might not necessarily translate into what someone wants to give you a job for right or they might say, okay, well, we'll hire you, but really you only have three years experience in this area. So we're going to pay you the same pay grade as someone who, you know, has only been working for three years, right? You see how that kind of backfired? The difference, of course, is that the person who has done five different jobs and seen so much more they're on more of a trajectory to either start their own business or lead a business. Okay. They're going down that path, that, that third way that they don't tell you about. But if you're sticking to the standard career path, you know, you go through a recruiter, you get a job, you apply for the posted job, right? Then this works against you. Right? So you got to make a decision. What are your goals? Where do you want to end up? Okay, so I agree with it, but there's that caveat. Um, Gopal says, hello, brother. I am from Nepal. Hello, Nepal. Nepal, Kathmandu, right? Broadcasting live from Kathmandu. Is K2 in Nepal? I know, I believe Everest is like one side of it is in Nepal, right? 
half comes down on the China side, half comes down on the Nepal, Nepal Nepalese side. Is K2 in Nepal? I think K2 is all the way in Nepal, isn't it? If, if I'm curious if if you know, if if you're still here, just uh let me know in the chat. Um Julian, which one do you think is more powerful, asking people for informational interviews or telling them my skills and what I can do to get their attention? Um Oh, informational interviews, hands down. That's useful for so many things. Um, telling people about you is almost in every situation is less useful. I mean, if you're going for a job or something, sure. You know, if there's like an opportunity right there. Yeah, I suppose. But it's always better to listen. Like in an informational interview, you're, you're not talking about yourself. You're you're asking somebody questions, somebody who's uh, somebody you want to learn from. So somebody, usually the best uh, application for that, in my experience, is you're going to try and get some face time with somebody that, uh, you know, is in a position of authority in an industry that you're, you uh, are in. <laughs> you like how I express that? That was very, that was uh, poetic. Um, but you know what I mean? Like if you're, if you're, let's say you're starting out, you're in your twenties and you're, uh, in it, you're, you've got, uh, some kind of educational qualification for computer science or coding or en computer engineering or something. And you aspire to go far in that industry of it, whether you're in like, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, you know, or robotics, or you're just doing code or, you know, you're writing, um, you know, applications, whatever, or your systems admin, whatever it is, you want to go far, right? So what could be more useful than, let's say you want to be a systems admin, right? What could be more useful than sitting down with the sort of the director that's in charge of a massive data center? Okay. They've been doing this for years. Uh, they've had a career where they've made decisions, where they've really grown their operation, their data center business. You know, they know the ins and outs of it. They know everything about it. They know where the industry is going, or at least they have a good idea of where things are going, right? What could be more useful than just sitting down with them for, you know, maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half and just asking them questions, just learning, just sucking up that knowledge, you know, you know, that would probably be really useful. So whatever, whatever you're interested in learning you have a meeting with like a one-to-one -one meeting, you get a coffee or, you know, whatever. And you ask them about them. You ask them about their career. You ask them about, you know, data centers. You ask them about the industry. You ask them about skills going forward or technologies that are emerging. You ask them about how they make hiring decisions. You ask them about how they make business decisions. You ask any, every, like all this stuff. What, what could be more useful, right? Now imagine if you had a whole bunch of those with different people. You know how much time you could save instead of learning all that stuff the hard way? You know, it's a very, very useful thing. Informational interviews are a very useful thing. This is something that's not taught. I've never heard of, you know, a school or something telling uh, high school students or even in university, anyone in university saying like, you know, if you want to learn about this industry, go sit down with the owner of a local software company. You know, depending on where you are, <clears throat> if you happen to be in a place that's like the center of an industry, go sit down with a vice president of a really big company. You know? Like Google, Microsoft, whatever. You know, if you happen to be in the same location where these, these places are, you know, very, very useful, incredible life skill, just be able to do in, get informational interviews of people. That's one of the values of LinkedIn. Someone was bringing up LinkedIn earlier. This is not taught. It's totally possible for everyday students, everyday people to do this. Okay. I know because I've done it many, many times myself, you know, but that's not taught. Forget about job interviews, do informational interviews. The other thing is, that, I mean, informa the informational interviews go can go in many, many different directions. They can turn into jobs. <clears throat> I mean, what are executives looking for? 
They're looking for people with the right attitude. They're looking for future employees. That's one of the things that they're casually on the lookout for, right? Somebody who would be an amazing employee. What would, what would an amazing employee look like? Well, first of all, they've got some technical skills, okay? Secondly, they're extremely passionate about doing this kind of work. Number three, they're passionate about your company, about working with you specifically, right? They, they've got great um, social skills, great communication skills. They're very likable, right? So, I mean, if you're doing informational interviews with people, right, like people higher up, that's a great way to have all that stuff on display. You're demonstrating that you're passionate about working with them because you're there. You've reached out to them. Number two, you know, you're showing off how awesome you are. If you ask the questions about them and they enjoy interacting with you, and they usually will because they're talking about themselves and their opinions and their life story and all this kind of stuff, you know, it goes a long way. That's, that's a skill that's not taught, you know, uh, life advice or career advice for people in your twenties, learn how to do an informational interview, learn how to get them, learn how to conduct them. Okay. That alone opens the doors on so many things. If you want to break into an industry, if you want to change careers, you want to learn how it all works. And then you want someone to give you a chance so you can get your foot in the door. You can accomplish all that in one fell swoop. If you do a couple of informational interviews with people in that industry. You know, that'd probably be like the number one actual specific thing I would recommend. Um, Julian continues. I feel also interview is better for me because I have good communication skills and I dress well, but I'm afraid people would be too busy to do it. Well, a lot of people are. I mean, the way informational interviews work is that you send out a bunch of invites, right? And a lot of times it'll be a small percentage that agrees, maybe 10%, 20% if you're highly effective at it. But like, that's probably the most you could hope for is a 20% return rate. That would be really fantastic. But I mean, in LinkedIn, you can contact 100 executives or 100 CEOs or 100 owners a day. So if you blast this out to 100 owners or 100 CEOs or 100 executives, you don't go lower than that. They've got to be an executive or higher, preferably a CEO or an owner, right? They're the ones that actually know what's going on. Um, you could do that in a day. You could send that out in a day. You could discover them in one day and you could send out 100 invitations the next day. So, okay, you get a return rate of 10%. 90% say they either don't respond or you might get a few no's, you know, some kind of response that says, no, sorry. But 10% say yes. So that's, you got 10 informational interviews with CEOs in your industry lined up. You know, one would be very useful. You know, I mean, it leads to a lot of things. And the thing is in business, like, okay, you know, I just thought of something. Um, back when I was younger, when I was in my 20s and 30s, I thought naively that, uh, you know, you, ha you get a job and how does your job work? You have to, s you have to stay it in your work area. If you're a knowledge worker, you have a desk and a computer and a phone. If you're uh, more of a shop worker or, you know, hands-on worker, you have your work area. Maybe you work in a shop or a factory. Maybe you work in a, a facility, okay, doing various uh, tasks. But you have to stay there. You know, you have to, you can't just go off property. I'm going to get in my car. I'm going to leave my uh, place of employment and I'm going to drive around the city. You know, you, you can't do that, right? Like, uh, that's, that's not considered work. That's bad, right? And because we, we usually start out getting jobs like that. Obviously, there's exceptions. If you're a courier, for example, yes, you drive around the city. But for most people, you can't just do that kind of activity. However, if you're like something like a salesperson, you're an outside salesperson, you a lot of times are kind of driving around on your own. You're going and meeting customers. You're having meetings with customers. 
you might do a tour of like several big customers maybe in a week, right? Your boss is not looking over your shoulder. Maybe they want you to report in every few hours to say what's going on, you know, something like that or or whatever. I don't know what the modern thing is. Maybe do, they, do they put GPS trackers on people yet? I, I don't know. But um, but I just naively used to think when I was younger that like, oh, you know, uh, you have to stay at work, right? That's how work is done. No, if you look at, you know, how executives do their job, they're going in and out of the office. They're usually away from the office. They're attending meetings, they're attending events, you know, things like this, right? You're meeting with people because those people are either your institutional customers or they're your partners or they're, you know, journalists or they're regulators or they're some other player in the business, right? A potential partner, a potential vendor, you know, things like this. You go to their site, you talk about maybe modifications to your uh, working agreement or working relationship this kind of thing. And you're meeting new people too, right? So if you're reaching out to these people for informational interviews, uh, the reality is, I mean, their job requires them to do this kind of activity as their sort of nine to five, like their daily kind of stuff. And they're also public facing. So if they get a request from someone that they don't know, they still have to entertain it. Okay. You never know who that could be. That could be, that could be like the best that could lead to the best business opportunity of your career. You know, you don't know, right? So if somebody presents themselves in a very professional way, following, you know, all the protocol, and they ask for something reasonable, and uh, it's something that's not really a big issue for you to give, most people are going to say yes. And, I mean, unless their schedule is absolutely packed or they're, at, or they're hectic because they're trying to put out some kind of fire, they're going to they're gonna entertain that. That's how these things work. That's why you don't go to middle management or worker level. You go to executive level, right? The other thing, the other bonus of doing that is that these people generally tend to have a lot better communication skills and diplomatic skills. They tend to follow protocol very well. So they're not going to send you like these rude sort of uh, hostile messages that you might get if you talk to people who aren't executives. You know, there was a comment that somebody wrote on one of my videos a couple of days ago. They said, I, I wrote it down here. It says, I called the company. They said to apply online. Yeah, because it sounds like what you did is you contacted the main switchboard or the reception desk and said, I'm looking for a job. So already that's several things done wrong. That's why it doesn't work. Right. Now, even if you uh, contacted an executive, okay, but you said all the wrong things. You said, you know, I'm looking for a job. Please help me. You know, something like that. They're going to come back probably with a no. A lot of times, though, it'll be a lot more polite. I mean, there are exceptions, right? There's some real jackasses in executive positions, especially in operations. But, uh, but most executives, to get to that level, you have to have good communication skills, good social skills. You know, if you want to see how to say no properly, a lot of times, that's what you're going to get. Okay, they're not going to be, what? Who the hell are you? No, you know, <laughs> what do you think this is? Go apply online. You know, you're, not going to, you're not going to get that kind of thing, uh, usually. Okay. But that's another fallacy. Oh, you know, you can't talk to these people. These people are so far above you, you know, that like, who do you think you are having, having the gall, for want of a better word, to talk to them? It's like, that's stupid. Nobody, I mean, there are exceptions, but nobody, nobody acts like that. That's stupid. And there is no barrier. It's all psychological. It's because they've never told you that that was possible. So you live your life thinking that's not possible. I've had to uh, introduce students to this. And the universal reaction I get is like, I can't talk to those people. Who am I? They won't talk to me. Well, you'd be surprised. You know how they're always like, like, what do they think about executives? Executives are always doing PR type things. They're doing things that where they're, they're taking, like, if you go on LinkedIn, and this is the thing that kind of annoys me. If you go on LinkedIn and you look at posts, the things that people post, it's all this like self-serving corporate PR stuff that's so 
transparent. You know, look, I'm a CEO. Look, I'm shaking hands with these disabled children. Oh, look, I'm meeting these people to talk about women in business. Look, I'm doing this like worthy cause, worthy cause. It's because they're trying to do the public relations thing and manufacture this image that, you know, they're everybody's friend and they're approachable and they're reachable and all this kind of stuff. That's what they want the world to see. Right? So you can imagine that's an inconsistent with if someone that they don't know contacts them and contacts them in a professional way, are they going to bite their head off and say no, even though they don't really know what you want? That's totally contrary to that. These people are looking to have a good public image, you know, and that's the other reason that this is a thing. You can approach them. You can see, at the very least, if you even, even if you're in school, you can say, hello, I'm a student. And I'm thinking of going into this industry one day. And I'd love to be able to just sit down and get your expert opinion on a couple of questions about your industry. Would that be okay? You know, you tell me what date, time, place, you know, I'll be there. You know, uh, very few people are going to go like, you know, what? No, no. What do you want? What do you want to talk to me about? You know, like there are some, usually those are the bad companies. Right? I've encountered that. Like, the people are just absolutely paranoid, you know? But this is a real thing. You can do this. So, anyway, I talk about that in my course. I talk about that on my regular videos anyway, so. Um, where did I leave off here? Um, Julien. Julien. Okay, did I do this one? It says, I feel, I feel... The informational interview is better for me because I have good communication skills and I dress well, but I'm afraid people would be too busy to do it. Okay, I think I, I, think I just addressed that. Um, Simeon, Simeon says, how can I develop my creativity? That's a good question. What do you mean? Creativity in what sense? Like artistic creativity? I mean, I, I was an engineer. I find that engineering is a very creative thing. Uh, like you talk to developers, people that do coding, they'll say coding is a very creative, you've got to come up with creative solutions to problems. Um, okay. Well, look, I'm sure you could go to a lot of like motivational type speakers, you know, those kind of people and ask that question and they'd give you all kinds of sort of warm, uh, little, you know, almost like little, uh, nice little pieces of advice. I'm going to answer that question in a way that it's not usually answered, okay? Um, in the world of business, okay, there is a field of study. I don't know if it's a field of study, but it's called TRIZ, T-R-I-Z. Tr it, it's spelled like TRIZ, but it's TRIZ. And that's one of the most fascinating topics or fields of study that I've ever encountered. And it deals with creativity. And what it is, is it was created by this guy who was the head of the patent office in, in the Soviet, the former Soviet Union. And, uh, like under, under Joseph Stalin, like back in, you know, the, the early fifties or something. And he had said like, like all the patents in the Soviet Union, like hopefully everybody knows what a patent is. When you have an invention, you want to say, this is my invention. And anyone who wants to use it has to pay me or get my permission. So you like f officially register your invention. That's, that, that's what a patent is, right? If you're in the UK, I think they call them patents. Anyway, so this guy was the head of the patent office in the Soviet Union. Every invention in the Soviet Union came across his desk. So after years of this, he started to see patterns in these inventions. It always seemed like it was the same principles. just applied a different way so he started to uh, he was a very bright guy and he turned this into uh like okay you know this patent this invention is just like the, using the same principle that this other person did to invent this other thing but in this was in the field of marine biology and this was in the field of automotive engineering like it was two different fields but it's the same idea right you solve this problem using the same principle so he made a list of all these principles and then he turned it into a tool. So it said like, look, if you're up against this type of problem, 
The people that have solved that type of problem before have done it by thinking in this particular way. Using, you know, this type of principle that tends to be a solution to this type of problem. So he turned that into a science. And uh, many years ago, when I was in my 30s, my late 30s or something, uh, I applied this in a work context where we had an issue. This, this was in a repair shop and we had a problem. We had a safety issue where someone was nearly um, hurt severely. That's what I can say on YouTube. I can't say any more than that. Um, it, and it involved cranes. It involved, uh, you know, there's a crane here going one way and there's a crane there going another way. And if, if you're not careful, if you're not really, really paying attention to what's going on, one crane hits the other, it leads to all kinds of problems. And, you know, people were almost hurt severely code for something else. So the problem was we got all the big brains around a table. You know, people that had been working in that environment for like 40, 50 years, people that were like experts on engineering, people that were experts on safety, people, you know, like every type of person, you know, basically all the big brains around a table and nobody could think of a solution to this other than what had already been tried and was shown to be ineffective. Okay. So brainstorming, basically, it just didn't produce any results. So you had to go beyond brainstorming to figure out a solution to this. So I brought in this, these principles of trees and we used the tools that this guy had set up. Uh, I think his name was Alshuler that invented trees. And uh, we came up with like, like it produced something like seven possible solutions to it. And like, I don't know, five or something we ruled out because we like of practical concerns, we couldn't get the materials or it would be too expensive to implement that. But there were like two or something that, that, you know, this is a solution and we can do it. And we did it and it worked. And it was just amazing. Absolutely amazing. It's like, it, it took the genius of people that had made inventions, like in another time and another place. And it's almost like you're sort of harnessing their, their thought power to apply to your problem. And it's like they basically said, okay, you need to think in terms of this and in this. Think of like this, think of that, you know, and then you come up with something. It's like, holy crap, that worked. So, so in terms of creativity, I mean, that still falls under the umbrella of creativity. Um, but that's called trees. Now, d just, just I'm going to say this because it's on the screen. In that course, by the way, one component is I added the course called Inventive Problem Solving, where it goes into trees. Uh, it recommends a book and then I give you a couple of videos on it. Um, so I put it in there, but you know, look this up. It's, it's not comp, it's not widely distributed, but it is a thing. And if used correctly, it can actually be this really amazing tool, uh, to use creativity, to come up with a solution that when brainstorming fails you, because every other way of problem solving that I've ever encountered in the business they use different names, different procedures, but basically, if you look at the actual step that generates the solution, it's essentially a brainstorming session of some kind, right? So if brainstorming doesn't work anymore, this is the only thing I've found that allows you to go beyond and still come up with something. So, so there you go. That, that, that's what I'll say about the creativity question. If you're interested, it's called tr uh, Trees, T-R-I-Z. Just en maybe enter that into Google or something and see where it takes you. Uh, Justin. Justin is saying some really nice things. Thank you, Justin. Uh, GV Logs, PH, says, Hi, Bill. What are your thoughts about inflating job titles on resumes or LinkedIn with the goal of snagging a job? Up to what extent can people inflate job titles? Well, this is the thing, like, this is one of the things that recruiters push back on in a job interview, right? They want to know what you actually did in a role, right? They, so good recruiters are aware that people inflate and exaggerate some things on their resumes, or at least they present the best possible scenario that's still ethical to say. Um, so they want to try and 
peel away the layers and like, hey, what did you actually do? Describe your job, describe your, your responsibilities, describe your duties, you know, and then they'll make an assessment based on what you say. Okay, I mean, as we all know, you are capable of putting absolutely anything you want on a resume. It could all be a complete fabrication, right? I'm not recommending that, of course. I'm saying it's within your power to do that. And the correction are the recruiters who then have to try and counteract that, right? So usually they can spot that simply by asking you a couple of questions. They might say, okay, describe this aspect of your job. Or you have the hiring manager there and the hiring manager says, like, okay, you say, you say that you were the general manager of this, that you, you claim that was your function. You know, what, what was the way that you uh, tackled this type of issue? You know, what was your policy? And the person says, oh, well, you know, I tried three approaches. Number one, I did this. That didn't really work. Number two, I did this. But the problem was this thing came up. Number three was I did this. That tended to work, but it still leaves the problem of this. And I haven't found a solution to that yet, because if you were to do this other thing, it would lead to this. If you were to do this other thing, it would lead to that. So, you know, that's why it's such an impasse. So I have partly addressed it, but, uh, and I haven't heard of anyone who's actually solved that directly. So if someone says something like that, you know, okay, this person knows their stuff and everything that they said checks out and, you know, they work in the same area as you. So it's like, okay, okay, that would be a verification of what they said on their resume that they did maybe if they inflated their title no it seems like they actually were general manager because if you weren't you probably wouldn't have been able to answer that question that good or that well okay so you can put whatever you want but they're going to call you on it so you better <laughs> you just be prepared for that okay uh that's usually how these things go why thank you i try my best you know, I was considering doing the uh, blue eyeshadow all the way up to my eyebrows, but all the other CEOs would make fun of me, so I decided not to. Um, Kirishima says, I have been out of work following the, the death of our child five years ago. Oh, I'm very sorry to hear that, Kirishima. Sorry as hell. I appreciate this is a long time, but I'm wondering how I should explain the gap on my CV. Is honesty best? That's a tough one. I mean, I've, I've been fortunate to never have been in that situation myself. And I imagine it depends on who you're dealing with. That would be a factor. I probably wouldn't lead with that. But if they ask you about it, you know, like, like say you get to the interview stage. Um, are you talking about an interview? Like, like if it's an, on an application, I probably wouldn't lead with that. I know it explains the work gap. I get that. I understand. But um, the work gap won't be the single most piece of information about you, you know, like the most important information about you. It'll be your, it'll be your technical qualifications and your experience. So I would put that on the application. Now, if, they're, if they are serious about looking into you, okay, an obvious question they would then have is, what's this work gap? Okay, and for that, if they asked you directly about that, I would, I would be honest and say, you don't have to go into detail. You could say just kind of what you said here. It's not necessary to go into any further detail. Okay? You know, and, and if they ask about more detail on this, uh, just to me, that, that seems like that would be weird. Okay? That's just my take on it. I'm not an expert of dealing with those highly sensitive personal situations, uh, certainly in a job interview. But that, that's how I would approach that. Okay? Not really a part of the application, but if asked directly in an interview, yes, be honest about it. Um, and remember, the goal is to not make them feel super awkward. Okay? Like, it's, it's a very touchy subject, understandably. And it might be very hard to... to really even mention it but um i would mention it and then just that's it you know like because the goal is not to like make the interview super awkward but if they're probing and they're asking directly about it and it looks very incriminating you got this five-year work gap that you can't justify otherwise 
uh, that might be something. Now, if there is something you've done, let's say during that five-year period, there's other things you could say, like you did go back to school or something like that. You could consider substituting that and then you avoid the entire issue. You know, if, I'm sure you're not wanting to bring it up specifically. Um, so if you can avoid it and not have it count against you, uh, that might be something too. But if, if you're forced to s disclose it as the reason, just disclose it. And don't go into detail. That, that would be how I would do it. That, that's all I can say. I'm sorry, I'm sorry as hell to hear that. JR says, yes, what is it? What is the best and what? Highest way to explain resume gaps? Mine is less than a year. Um, I've done videos on that. Short answer is, you know, if you've, if you've done volunteering, if you've done any education or training, you know, you can say that. You can say, oh, well, I went back to school for, to brush up on my skill, to brush, to um, sort of refresh my, uh, you know, sales skills or technical skills, whatever in this area. And uh, now that I've done that, I'm ready to rejoin the workforce. You know, um, it doesn't have to be a total lie also. I mean, if you're still out of work and this is an issue right now, go and take a couple of online, like free online training classes. And then you can say, honestly, yeah, I went back to school. During this period of unemployment, I went back to school and I brushed up on my skills. And now that I've, you know, rounded out my skills in this area, I'm ready to go back. You know, something like that. That's, that's usually a good way of, of doing it. And if they want details, you give them details. Yeah, I took this course, this certificate, this qualification. You know, I have those. I can provide those for you upon demand. Do you wish me to provide those? Usually the answer will be no. You know, and it's like, okay, well, there you go. It's all up front. It's all above board. Um... You know, if you were a stay-at-home mom or something like that, I mean, those, that, those are obviously equally valid. You know, it's a valid reason. If you had a death in the family or something like that, uh, that's an equally valid reason. You know, I, I, most recruiters or hiring managers will not probe deeper into it. You know, there's always exceptions, but most of them will just leave it there. You mentioned that, it's like, okay, okay, it checks out. They had a good answer for it. I guess we're sort of going back into just job stuff, aren't we? Um, hey, it's Ceranical the Goat. I remember you. You're back at it again. Should you personalize LinkedIn outreach messages in a specific way so you can earn information interviews? People, you don't earn information interviews you. You are granted them. Um, yes, there is definitely a way. I can't get into it now. That's all in my course, by the way. I've also done some free some free videos on that stuff. Yeah, you don't, I mean, you personalize it in the sense that, you know, at the very least you say their name, right? Any message to anyone, you should say their name, right? If you don't, it just, it's so obviously impersonal that a lot of professionals won't, won't even read it, you know? Um, you know, a lot of times you have to go further. If there's someone really high up, really busy, that doesn't have to do this and, and probably get a lot of inquiries from the public, you know, you should, you should go further. You need to go further. You say, you know, dear, you know, whatever, hello, and then give them something personal, what you like about their company, what they're doing, or, you know, like, I don't know. I get a lot of spam. I get like uh, 50 emails a day at least. I, I block them. So I'm sure I would get much more if I didn't do that. But but, you know, it's all this stuff. And the, th and the thing that obviously gives it away is like, they say, hello, and then they insert your name, and then they immediately start talking about themselves. Nothing about you. It's like, I don't know who you are. I don't give a crap who you are. You know, you're giving me all this detail on you. You know, why, why should I be interested? You know, and I'm a normal human being in that sense. You know, you, some stranger contacts you and talks to you all about them. It's like, great you know but it's and, and it's also of the nature like they're trying to sell you something you know it's like double fail you know so you know it's just so yes you need to personalize things um 
But like, if you're really wanting to learn that stuff properly, I put it all in this course. It's, it's not something that's like short. It's something that's based on many different principles, all one after another. You have to take them all into account and they all combine to give you a result, right? Um, Mr. D says, why HR managers always ask about salary in the first? Yeah, okay, we're getting away from career advice, aren't we? Always ask salary in the first four cycles, like any requirement. Yeah, well, look, look, I've, the most popular video on my YouTube channel goes into that. So maybe check that out, Mr. D. I've done several videos on salary, and that's kind of one of the first things I cover. So check those out. What you're wondering is why they're asking what to say when they ask you what your expectations are, what to say, when they ask you what is your current salary, what to say, right? When they ask you at the beginning, what do you say, when is the right time to negotiate, how does salary negotiation work? You want to learn up on all those subjects. That's not something I can really cover very quickly right here, unfortunately. But I have videos on all of those. So just go to my channel and whichever one of those topics you're most interested in, check out my video, including the one that's got like 5 million views, which is my most popular video, answers that. Okay? So, we've been at this for quite a while, an hour and a half. Um, I want to try and summarize some points here, okay? That, and just make sure, I'd written down some notes like a week ago on this. This is, this is what I was saying. First of all, if you're in your 20s, I want you to realize that you're awesome. You don't always feel like it, and certainly in this game of careers, and certainly if you're going for a job, you're not made to feel like that very often, okay? The reality is that you are awesome. You have a lot of energy, a lot of talent. You've got so much possibility ahead of you, okay? The world is your oyster. The people that are like my age and older, they wish they had what you have, okay? They're jealous of you guys, that you, you, know, you have your whole life ahead of you. You have energy, you have passion. Um, because that's what they don't have, you know? There's a lot you can do with that energy and that passion, okay? And there's a lot of possibilities out you. Knowledge will be your best ally to know what's out there and to know how to achieve it, okay? Pursue knowledge. Pursue self-improvement, okay? That, it's never wasted time. Even if it doesn't produce results immediately, it's never wasted time, okay? Um, specifically, things like just basic stuff like social skills, communication skills, learning to be likable, uh, understanding the protocol of how to deal with people, how to interact with people. This stuff pays, it pays for itself thousands of times over. Who do they give the promotion to? They give the promotion to the person the boss wants to work with, right? Who do they give the job to? The, they give the job to the person that they had the best warm, fuzzy feeling about usually. They were the most likable. You know, they don't give the job to the person who's got an attitude problem or the person that looks upset, you know, or extremely uncomfortable, or they have like just fanatical views, you know, or whatever, right? I mean, obviously there's exceptions to everything, but that's the general rule, right? So work on yourself, learn as much as you can, have an open mind. When I was in my twenties, I was very close minded to a lot of things. I knew it all. And a common situation is that in your 20s, everybody feels like they know it all. And then usually the cliche is that in your 30s, by that time, you failed and you're more humble and now your mind is more open to the fact that you don't know it all and now you're actually willing to learn. Because the first thing you've got to realize is that you don't know everything. Once you realize that, then you're more willing to learn new things, right? So that's kind of the cliche and it's true. And I can certainly speak for that. Um, try things, okay? Manage your risk, but try things, okay? Um, maybe you're the type of person that has a certain comfort in doing the same thing over and over. You know, you, you, you understand it, you feel like you're good at it, gives you a sense of comfort, you feel like you're in control, that's great. Don't let that keep you from doing anything else ever, okay? Uh, keep moving, keep learning, okay? Do it in an intelligent way. I'm not saying you have to like take massive financial gambles all the time. You shouldn't. You shouldn't. You should play it safe financially. Do it smart. But keep moving. Try new things. If you're working in a place and they're not promoting you after a couple of years, maybe consider leaving to do something else, you know, so that you keep moving. You keep getting exposed to different things. Okay. You will end up very worldly 
and you will see all kinds of possibilities. You'll see what they are and where they are. Okay, that's a that's, uh, thing. So try stuff. Um, realize that there are more worlds than what you're aware of. When we're young, you know, we know the world of school. And then you get out and then you might know another world, like the world of casual jobs or the world of that one profession. But there's more things outside of it, okay? And there are more, there, there's more things out there than the standard career path, okay? If you get trained for a certain job, say you have an accounting degree or you have a law degree or you have, I don't know, an engineering degree, like in my case, you think, oh, I got an engineering degree, I, sh I will work as an engineer. You think I have a law degree, so I will work as a lawyer. What you don't realize is there's a thousand other professions that are willing to hire you because you have a law degree or an engineering degree that you've never even considered. You know? So remember, there's all those other worlds. And that's just within the world of employment where you're working for somebody else. Okay? Um, and I spent a lot of time today talking about, you know, informational interviews and connecting with people high up and stuff. Go around gatekeepers. Gatekeepers are artificial. If you call a company and you want to talk to the boss, what, what are you going to get? You're going to get a receptionist of some kind or some type of gatekeeper that's going to say, well, they're very busy. I'll pass on your message, which of course means I won't pass on your message. Um, so a lot of people will just end there. They'll say, oh, I was told that that's that I can't talk to them. So I just accept that. The reality is that a lot of that is smoke and mirrors. It's self-serving stuff that people say. It's it's too much trouble for them to walk across the room to knock on the boss's door and open it and say, "Yeah, could you pick up line 2? There's someone that wants to talk to you." That's too much trouble for the receptionist. They don't want to get up and walk 20 feet. So they tell you, oh, uh, no, you know, the boss is unavailable. I'll pass your message on, right? Um, this is what we usually find. It's usually a smokescreen. It's usually uh, a psychological barrier. There is no actual barrier, okay? A lot of the business world is like that. A lot of extroverts know this. If you are an introvert, you may not know this yet. Uh, I mean... Is that true in 100% of the cases? No, but in, say, 90%? You know? So just recognize that. A lot of barriers and a lot of things like that are artificial, especially if it's stuff that people tell you. Okay? The only way you realize it is by trying things and by doing things. Okay? Don't let anybody tell you that you can't, it can't be done. Okay? If it's something that you're suspicious about and you think it might be able to be done, try it. Find a risk-managed way you can do it. Um, you know, and have persistence. I see a lot of people that leave comments on my YouTube channel that indicate that they don't have a lot of persistence. Oh, I tried this once and I failed, so I gave up. You know, it's like, okay, well, if it's important to you, you might want to keep going, right? You know, where's that boundless energy that a lot of 20-year-olds have? If it's important and it's something you really want to do, maybe you should consider trying again, right? Try several times again. Uh, learn from it. If it's the, the same thing is not working, maybe tweak it. Someone was asking earlier about creativity. How can I develop my creativity? Well, try something. Try to do something. And if it goes the way it usually goes, a door will slam right in your face. You know, it'll, you'll be at an impasse. Oh, that didn't work. Sometimes that's in the form of a person telling you, you can't do this, right? Find the ways around it. Usually, that person, you know, this seemingly powerful person that seemingly is all knowledgeable and is informing you that, you know, what you're trying to do can't be done. Usually, I would say well over 90% of the time, they're talking through their hat. They have absolutely no idea what they're talking about, but they're assuring you that it can't be done. I met a lot of those kind of people in academia. They know nothing about anything, but they're absolutely positive that it can't be done. It's like, yeah, I met a lot of those people. I, I met a lot of these people that would love to tell me that something that I already did years ago is impossible. You know, I met that a lot. And it stems from a certain mentality, a certain attitude. 
They just accept what they're told by anyone and they take it as gospel, right? Don't be afraid to question things. Don't be afraid to try stuff. I mean, don't be a jackass about things, but you know, go around them. If someone tells you the boss is available and can't speak to you, find another way of contacting the boss. You know, and I mean, this isn't like guerrilla warfare tactics here. You would just call somebody else and say, you know, yeah, uh, who would the boss be? What's their name? I forget. And they say, oh, that would be John Smith. You go, okay, thank you. You call the next day, you talk to a different receptionist. Would you happen to have John Smith's direct line? You know, I, I wrote it down, but I can't find, you know, whatever they, oh, that would be this number. Okay. So you call John Smith, you leave a message after hours. You say, hi, my name is this. I was wondering this, you know. If you would be kind enough to get back to me, I'd really appreciate it. Most people say, sure. There you go. You're talking to John Smith. You see how hard that was? And John Smith was happy to call you. And it turns out that when they called you, you had a 25-minute conversation. It was really positive, really pleasant. There wasn't an issue at all. It was just a lazy, incompetent gatekeeper that was standing in your way. And a lot of people would be deterred by that. They'd be, okay, I guess that doesn't work. But if you persist a little, you see that a lot of this stuff is artificial. And it's these things that you thought were not possible are possible after all. Um, the only other thing I had in my summary here was just the importance of soft skills, networking. Learn about it. It's valuable. It'll help you in all kinds of situations, all kinds of professions, whatever level you're at. You can discover job opportunities. You can discover learning opportunities. You can discover all kinds of things. Okay. Networking is really, really important. Uh, even for introverts, even for technical people. Okay. I'm speaking directly to you guys. This doesn't come naturally to you, but you know what? The reality is that it's so much easier than you think it is. Um, like for example, I'll give you an example right here. Most people that, I mean, not, not to sound all high and mighty and arrogant, but if, you know, if, if you've been at the executive level, even in smaller, mid-sized companies, uh, most of those people, they would stay off a platform like YouTube. They feel that, you know, oh, that kind of cheapens you by going on YouTube. Right? You know, there's a lot of people that can share a lot of knowledge and experience, more than I can. But they've all decided to stay off things like YouTube. They have way better public speaking abilities and conversational abilities than I do, but they've decided to stay off YouTube. And it's their loss, <laughs> you know? Um, because not only is this fun, it's, you know, it, it, it pays off, and I, and I like doing this. You know? Um, you know, and, I, and I'm not a stereotypical YouTuber. I'm not young, and I'm not hip, and I'm not, you know, doing all kinds of flashy stuff. Uh, you know, just go for stuff. Networking is important. Conversational skills, public speaking skills. Work on your public speaking skills. That will help you in many areas. That'll help you have confidence in yourself. It'll help you feel good about yourself. It'll allow you to uh, get promotions and things at work. Because a lot of times, promotions don't really depend on your technical skills. They depend on your social skills. You know, you might have a brilliant technical person, but Part of being the part of being the boss, like the, the the job, is you have to get up and talk to people. You also have to represent your department or your group or your team or whatever you're doing. Uh, so you have to talk to people in public, and you've got to look good. You've got to dress up in a suit or in professional business clothes, and you have to talk to other people in professional business clothes. Uh, you know, maybe people you're not super interested in talking to, but you got to do it anyway, and you got to look like you're enjoying yourself. Right. So if you can't do that, that kind of limits you. What a stupid reason to be limited in your career. Just because you, I mean, you might have a amazing grasp of mathematics and programming, like stuff that it's taken you years and years to learn. Most people can't do, but they don't give you the job because what you couldn't put on a suit and talk to somebody. It's stupid. So the best bang for the buck is learning those social skills. Um, you know, charisma and stuff like that. Learn, try, like, watch, I don't know, watch a bunch of YouTube videos by other people who have talked about that and they'll tell you all how to do that stuff. Sales skills. Even if you're an introvert, even if you're a technical person, you, you hate sales, you hate the idea of sales, learn the absolute basics of it. It'll help you. 
you know um yeah that's pretty much i think what i covered here okay what have you guys been saying um okay beck a beck a is a member uh hey is it okay to ask questions related to the salary oh here we go again how to increase in future at the first meeting with the director i agreed for offered salary however i believe it could be more how to be okay we're persisting with the salary thing listen um the only time you can have an actual meaningful serious conversation about salary is after they've offered you the job okay so so when you say when you first meet the director if it's after they've given you an offer then yes if it is before they've given you an offer they haven't given you a job offer yet you can't have a serious discussion about it any question about it will be some kind of elimination thing okay now if it's like your maybe third interview and finally you're meeting with the director and they bring up salary okay you don't want to bring it up but if they bring it up okay give them a range you know just say i don't know somewhere between here and here i haven't thought about it too like it's something i was going to think about if i was offered the job but you know at this point all i can tell you is between here and here somewhere in there probably should be okay you know depending on details that's you don't want to have a conversation about salary until they offer you the job it's just that simple because you have absolutely nothing to bargain with you know if they don't feel like paying what you're what they're hearing from you they just hire somebody else they haven't decided on a person yet there it's, it's a factor for elimination it's not a serious discussion about achieving a mutually beneficial uh compromise it's about you know it's about just whether we're going to eliminate you from the running or not. So you don't want to have these discussions. I don't care who you're talking to if it's before they've given you an offer. Um, and if you believe it could be more, then the way to handle that is when they give you an offer, you know, and it's important to you, you require it. You say, I need you to change that number to this before I can accept. You see, the reality is that everybody feels they should be paid more. Every single person feels they should be paid more. You know? The only question is what they have in mind to pay you and whether you will accept it, whether it works for you or it doesn't. That's the only relevant question here. Okay? You will not be honest about your side of it. They will not be honest about their side of it. Okay, that's the situation. So the only way you can resolve this impasse is you wait for them to have decided on you, right? They've checked references. They've done background checks. They've done all the interviews they want to do with you. They've verified anything else they need. They put some time into it. And they've had it in their head that, okay, that's the person we're getting. So when they hear that, it might not happen. That causes them pain. They're thinking, oh crap, I had my heart set on that person. And we put all this work into them. Right? So they want to salvage it. They want it to work. So if you're asking for this, they're going to try and satisfy that. Okay? So that's how you, that's how you deal with this. Okay? Becky says, in general, what are your advice for youngsters who are starting their job, like how to be in probation period well the single most important thing you can do for that is talk to your immediate boss okay the person who has authority to to fire you like at the end of the probation period or to promote you or keep you on like like the person that's calling the shots okay Maybe that could be your immediate supervisor, because even though they don't hire and fire people, they make recommendations to the manager who does. Okay, the manager will listen to the recommendations of the supervisor. They'll say, Mr. Supervisor or Madam Supervisor, how is this new employee working out? Should we renew their contract or should we uh, get rid of them? And they'll pretty much do whatever the supervisor recommends. So in that case, it would be the supervisor. Go to your supervisor. At regular intervals, I would say maybe once a week, depending on what you're doing, and just check in and say, like, look, like, how am I doing? You know, uh, is there anything that uh, I'm doing that you would like me to do different? You know, and then listen to their feedback. And then whatever they tell you to do, 
basically, you know, that, that's what you do, okay? And that way you will, number one, by doing this, first of all, you're signaling to them that you care about being a good employee and you want to be a good employee. Number two, your actual performance improves and then there isn't really much of a question, you're a good employee, right? So uh, that's probably the single most useful thing to do uh, for any new job. If it's something you're just starting, you don't know how to do it, um, you don't know if you're doing what they want exactly, so, so you, you get that feedback, okay? Go to them when they're not busy. Go to them, you know, like maybe immediately after lunch, when people come back from lunch break on a Friday or something, and just say, so, you know, you got, you got a couple of minutes, and then talk to them one-on-one, just say, just, you know, just checking in, like, how am I doing? Is there something you'd like me to improve in, uh, you know, the way I'm doing this, is it okay? Would you like me to change any part of it? You know, that kind of stuff. Don't pester them. Don't do it every day, but do it at regular intervals. And, and that will, you know, that, that will do, it'll solve several problems at once. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, I got to try and get through the rest of these uh, comments because I am going to be signing off soon. Um, Desert Duck, like your long-winded trip to nowhere. <laughs> okay, good. You like that? Awesome. Good insights from you and relatable experiences. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to watch this a couple more times. You have many gems here. Okay, well, thank you. Um, that's very, very nice to get that kind of feedback, Desert Duck. Um, and yeah, you know, everybody here, you guys are awesome. You know, you're here for self-improvement of some kind. That's the ticket. You keep, you keep learning. You keep picking up little tips. You keep trying things. You know, you wait a couple of years and you have really progressed in the right way. Andre says, hey, I have a question. I finished university last year. However, I have four years of work experience because I worked during university. That's awesome. So did I. Uh, now, unfortunately, I got laid off and I'm interviewing, but I'm losing opportunities to more experienced candidates. So, okay. Okay. I get that. And I'm applying to junior positions. It happened more than once. Any advice here? No, just keep going, Andre. Okay. Just keep going. There's, there's nothing that you've done that's bad, and there's nothing that you're doing that's bad. That's all fine. The only thing I would add is that after you persist, and let's say you've gone down the road a bit and you're still in the same situation, like you're still not getting anywhere, um, number one, look at your soft skills, okay? Because interviewing is all about soft skills. Okay, uh, like when you say you're losing opportunities, does that mean you're getting the interviews, but you're failing the interviews or you're not even getting interviews? If you're failing the interviews, work on your soft skills. If you're not getting the interviews, um, it would be something to do with your resume slash application if there is anything to improve. Okay, if you've gone down the road a little bit more you've done a lot more of these and still no improvement. You're still not seeing any favorable results. Check out other ways of getting a job. Okay. Instead of just applying for posted positions. Okay. I can't really get into the details here because it's huge, but the bottom line is that there's much better ways of getting a job than responding to job ads. That's the default way. Um, for many reasons, there are better ways of getting a job including what I've talked about, I've touched on here, like things like informational interviews. Those are much more favorable, much more promising. And the jobs you get through those tend to be a lot better jobs. Okay. So, so step into that world. Okay. I've got some stuff on my channel. I mean, I do have a course that covers the whole thing. If you want to do that, that's a solution for some people, but, uh, you're doing nothing wrong so far. Okay. Zhu, how, how do you say that? Zhu uh, says, thank you so much for doing this for us. My pleasure. I'm glad you're here. Thank you for being here. Um, Julian says, thank you very much, sir. You're very appreciated. Thank you. I appreciate you guys being here. If you guys weren't here, I wouldn't be able to do this. So, uh, And also thanks to Becky and thank you for being a member. That's awesome. Says, I thank, thank you. I appreciate your time and help. And Parth says, hello, how, how are you today? I'm great. I'm so great that I'm about to sign off. Thank you for being here, everybody. Uh, this was kind of something slightly new for me. 
And um, I might do this again. Uh, if anybody has any topic suggestions, let me know. And other than that, I will be back with a general Q&A tomorrow. So tomorrow, my usual time, uh, general questions about job interviews, careers, resumes, applications, all that stuff, networking. Join me 